Welcome to the GCN Racing News Show. Coming up this week, newly crowned world champion Mads Pedersen debuts his rainbow bands in Belgium in a race which saw fresh controversy over the use of barriers with feet in the finishing straight. We've also got Giro della Emilia, the GP Bigelli, more international cyclocross from Belgium, the latest rider transfer news and team news, and unfortunately, some sad news as one of cycling's most influential figures, Giorgio Squinzi, passed away. We're going to start though with the Giro dell'Emilia from Saturday. It's a race that started back in 1909 and which has taken place every year since, including incredibly through both world wars. The start list for the men's race was really something to behold. Amongst them, Alejandro Valverde, Vincenzo Nibli and all three winners of the Grand Tours this year. Richard Carapaz, Egan Bernal and Primoz Roglic. It's the first time that we've had all three Grand Tour winners at the same race since the 2016 Volta Catalunya, where Contador, Froome and Aru were all taking part. Emilia is characterized by the climb to the sanctuary in San Luca, 2.2 kilometers at 10% and the same one which was used in the opening time trial of this year's Giro d'Italia, a stage won by Roglic. The first rider of the really big names to attack was Jakob Fulsang on the penultimate time up it, a move which drew almost all of the strongest climbers clear of the rest. Ultimately though, it would all come down to the final ascent to the finish line. Mike Woods of EF Education first using the steepest section of 18% to make his move. He quickly opened a gap. However, soon on his wheel and straight past it was Roglic, and it wasn't long before the Vuelta winner had gone clear solo. In his usual high cadence style, he showed us all that he's far from finished in 2019. Coming home a full 15 seconds ahead of Woods, who crossed the line just in front of his teammate, Sergio Hergita. That's the first major one-day win in Roglic's career, and he's firmly announced himself now as one of the favourites for the last monument of the year, Il Lombardia, which is this coming Saturday. His time up the San Luca climb, according to Amati Piorali on Twitter, is the fastest ever, chopping six seconds off Vincenzo Nibali's effort from two years ago. He's also the first rider ever to win this race off the back of a Vuelta win. And in fact, only one other rider has ever won it off the back of a Grand Tour in that same season. That person, as you can probably guess, was Eddie Merckx, who did it back in 1972. In the women's event earlier that day, unfortunately, we didn't get to see Annemiek van Vluten debut her rainbow jersey. She'd fallen ill in the run up to the race and wasn't able to take the start. The majority of the 99 kilometer race was flat with just a single ascent of the San Luca climb to the finish. And it was there, of course, where the winner was decided. Five women pulling clear midway up it, including Elisa Longa Borghini, who has won the race twice before. It was her who kicked first to the line with around 300 meters to go, but glued to her wheel was Demi Vollering of Park Hotel Valkenburg. And it was the young 22 year old who would find the strength to cross the line first, underlining her emergence as one of the best climbers on the women's scene. Longa Borghini had to settle for second with another youngster, Nikola Noskova, in third. The following day saw the 23rd running of the Grand Premier Bruno Bigelli. Nowhere near as tough in terms of terrain as Amelia, but still not easy. 10 laps of the finishing circuit contained the climb of the Zappolino, which at one and a half kilometers and 5% is often not enough to allow the climbers to do their thing, but enough to sap the strength and speed of the sprinters. The race winning move there came over the top of the final ascent and it was a very strong group. Valverde, Hey Godu, last year's winner Molima, former winner Colbrelli, Garcia Cortina and Guillaume Martin. Colbrelli was the fastest on paper and as it turned out, the fastest on the road too. He took his second win at the event and his third of the season ahead of Valverde and Haig. The women's event ended in a bunch sprint with Marta Bastianelli continuing her tremendous season to take the win ahead of Lorena Wiebes. That marked her 11th victory of the year so far. Can I just say though, the Park Hotel Valkenburg team have been the revelation of the season in women's cycling for me. They are now up to equal second in Pro Cycling Stats' own team rankings ahead of the likes of Sunweb, Trek Segafredo and Canyon Shram, who operate on far bigger budget. So rather than a Rider of the Week this week, we're gonna have a Team of the Week. Well done to Park Hotel Valkenburg for everything that you've achieved this year. 
The Tour de Lure Metropole saw newly crowned world road race champion Mads Pedersen debut his rainbow jersey and custom Trek bike. And I've only got to tip my hat to whoever designed that bike. It looks gorgeous. He also got to wear the number one on his back as the winner of the race in 2018. He wasn't able to repeat that on this occasion. The race ended up in a reduced sprint won by Pete Allegar of Sport Flandre and Balois, his first win of the year. And as a rider that's currently looking for a contract for next season, it couldn't have come at a better time. The finish though, saw more controversy as a crash saw De Koenig Quickstep rider Alvaro Hodge hit the deck hard. He suffered a left forearm fracture, two fractured ribs, and a left shoulder fracture, which will require an operation. The cause of the crash was the type of barriers used in the finishing straight, which had feet, as opposed to the slanted barriers that the UCI recommends for the finishing straight of races. And it's a recommendation rather than a requirement. As you can imagine, it provoked a fresh tirade of criticism for pro riders who are understandably sick of so much being invested in measuring of sock length, while basic safety issues still don't appear to have been addressed. Possibly the most vocal of all was Matteo Trentin, who took to Twitter to say that barriers with feet should be banned in any part of any race, not just the finale. And it's quite hard to argue with that, isn't it? Given how many crashes we've seen this year alone because of those barriers. It'll be interesting to see whether the UCI impose a new ruling on them for 2020. Before we go any further, I just wanted to let you know what racing we've got coming up here on GCN Racing this week. On Tuesday, those of you in North, Central and South America will be able to watch live coverage of the Trey Valley Varacine. We've also got shorter highlight version for you worldwide, which we'll also have for the rest of the Italian one-day races, Milano Torino on Wednesday, Gran Piemonte on Thursday, and then the big one, Il Lombardia on Saturday. It's also another big weekend of cyclocross with the third round of the Ethias Cross on Saturday, followed by the first round of the Super Prestige from Heaton on Sunday. Some geo restrictions do apply, but commentary will be with myself and Jeremy Powers. And if you've got any suggestions for what you would like to see in the halftime show between the women's and the men's races, we'd love to hear them. Please let us know in the comments section below. Before we get on to cyclocross, we also had the Crow race last week. The general classification of the six day race was basically decided on the penultimate day. Adam Yates of Mitchelton Scott proving he was a class above the rest on the fishing climb to Platak, putting 10 seconds into second place Davide Vieira. In finishing seventh on the final stage, Yates wrapped up the GC, which was his fifth win of the season. The race wasn't without incident. An overzealous official chasing down stage winner Eduardo Groschu after the line got in the way of the riders who'd been sprinting behind him, taking two of them down in quite a nasty crash. Again, not the first time that this has happened in recent times and another concern to safety that the riders could do without. What most people would describe as proper cyclocross conditions awaited the riders at the GP Pelt and the Rectivit Cross Series. Plenty of rain and mud made for some exciting racing. Formerly the Sudal Classics with a new sponsor, the Elite Women's Race showed that Celine Del Carmen Alvarado has come into the cross season on brilliant form as the Coronan Circus rider put in a near flawless performance to take a second victory of the weekend. From triple seven rider Yara Kastelein and another Dutch sensation, 17 year old Shirin Van Androoy of Team 185 Fresh from a silver medal in the junior time trial at the Worlds in Yorkshire. She rounded out the podium and watch out for her as the cross season progresses. Now, I know we have a bit of a bunny hop obsession in cross, but we have to show some appreciation as well for Annick Van Alphen, who hopped her way to a fine eighth place in some tough conditions. Pal Sows and Bingo's Laurent Swake was looking to take four victories in a row and continued what has been a successful start to his cyclocross season. In the early stages, 
It looked like it would be Lars van der Haar who could be a force to be reckoned with until he came unstuck and what has been notoriously his arch nemesis in terms of obstacles when he took a proper tumble at the planks. This initially handed the lead to Tom Meusen, one of the most technically gifted riders of his generation who was managing to ride sections in the tough conditions that no one else could. Eventually though, it was Kontan Hermans that got clear. It would turn into a battle between the Telenet Balwars rider and Swake behind, and it came down to a small slide and the difference in a remount position at top of one of the steep banks for the lead to change hands and for Swake to ride away to victory. Hermans hung on for second, while well, you've got to say hats off to Van der Haar, who battled back to round out the podium in third. The previous day saw the second round of the Ethias Cross, the Baron Cross, literally translated as the Bear Cross. It's an absolute joy of a course to watch, probably not to ride, as our co-commentator Helen Wyman said in our live broadcast. It's got sand, planks, bridges, and a double pump track-esque BMX rhythm section. So what can we take away from the elite women in men's races? Well, Corinne and Circus's Celine Del Carmen Alvarado got her cross season off there to a phenomenal start by out sprinting triple sevens and a many worse after coming into the finish in a group that also contained world under 23 champion Inga van der Heinen of CCC Live and Mount Captains of Pau Sals and Bingo. With the absence of three time winner Mathieu van der Poel and Wout van Aert, it was anyone's game. Man of the moment, Ellie Isabet looked great before coming a cropper on the planks on lap two. He took a while to recover, but he would eventually find his way back to the front. Teammate and former world under 23 champion Michael Van Torenhout went solo on lap four. So often in the elite races, he's the nearly man. Though on the occasion, his luck held and so did the power. Despite Tone Art putting in his trademark acceleration towards the end, Van Torenhout fought back to hold on for his second win of the season ahead of Isabit, who left a tiring arts to take second while the Telenet Balwas rider took third. One nation who we've seen something of a resurgence of sorts from over the past five years or so is the EKZ Cross Tour in Switzerland. The first round was held on a great course in Egel again. It had a little bit of everything, including another BMX rhythm section. In the women's race, two-time overall winner and four-time round winner Pavla Havlakova was the big favourite. Nevertheless, it was Frances Perrine Clozel, who has already had two victories to her credit this season, who started with confidence and stood out quickly to lead the race throughout. Barely half a minute behind Clozel was young Swiss rider Zina Bahumi, who finished second, while Lena Berkier surprised by taking third after a very competitive final sprint, with favourite Pavla Havlakova finishing fifth. The men's race remained open for a long time with a very tight leading group. Spanish champ Felipe Orts was constantly on the offensive, but his pursuers, Dieter Van Toren, and how Vitsa Bosman's young Swiss Laurence Rieger and Belgian Vinnie Bastans kept him within striking distance. And ultimately, it would be last year's winner Bastans who put in a storming final lap to take the victory in Eagle. The next Telenet UCI World Cup is in Bern in two weeks' time. The power shown by the Swiss on that past weekend shows that it could be an exciting home World Cup for them. We were all very saddened to hear last week of the passing of Dr. Giorgio Scrinti. For those of you who are a little newer to the world of cycling, you may not recognise the name, but Squinzy was one of the most influential characters the sport has ever seen. In 1993, he and his company Mappé formed one of the most iconic teams in the sport. A quick look through some of the riders who rode for Mappé at some point in their careers is like looking at a who's who of the world's best cyclists from that time. It was a doping scandal involving one of their riders, Stefano Garzelli, that ultimately led to Squinzy closing the doors on the team at the end of 2002. But he is fondly remembered by the whole community as a man with incredible passion for the sport. Amongst them, Charlie Regalius, who said, Giorgio Squinzi's passion for cycling changed my life forever. I will never forget my time as part of the Mappe family and still cherish friendships from those days. My deepest condolences to Dr. Squinzi's family and friends. And we at GCN would like to add our condolences to rest in peace, Giorgio, and thank you for everything you did for our sport.
We're going to move on now to some team and transfer news. Last week, a Team Katusha takeover was confirmed by the Israel Cycling Academy. The UCI is still in the process of approving it, but it should mean that the Israeli team will end up with a World Tour license in 2020. Katusha, though, aren't finished in the sport. They will continue to co-sponsor a men's team and apparently become the title sponsor of a professional women's team next year, which is great news. Unfortunately, though, Rome Point Charles announced that they have been unable to find a replacement sponsor and so will cease operations at the end of the year, leaving 18 riders and at least as many staff searching for jobs for next year. Meanwhile, the UCI have announced last week the teams who have applied for licenses for next year. French squads, Arkea Samsic and Cofidis have applied for World Tour licenses, but Total Direct Energy haven't, which could be risky. As with the possible 20 teams in the World Tour, it means there will be only one wildcard place available at each of the Grand Tours next year. On to some transfer news now, and we'll start with Andre Greipel. The German sprinters signed a two-year deal with Arkea Samsic at this time last year, but by mutual consent, the second year of the contract has been annulled. As yet, it's unclear as to whether Greipel will continue to race in 2020 or hang up his wheels. That same team continues to be very busy in the transfer market, though. In just the last week, they've announced the signing of Toma Buda, Nasser Buhani, Dan McClay, Christopher Nopper, and Wukash Ofsian. Rowan Dennis, who just took his second world time trial title, is rumoured to be heading to Team Ineos next season. You'll remember last week that Barre Marina announced that they'd cancelled his contract with the team, but you'd think that a move to Ineos could be a good one for him. Heading away from Ineos is David De La Cruz, who is going to UAE Team Emirates. The Israel Cycling Academy also announced last week that they'd signed James Peakley, one of the revelations of the season over in North America. This will be his second effort at making it in Europe. And if his results this year are anything to go by, I think it might be second time lucky. Okay, that's it for this week. Don't forget to join us for all that live racing if you can. In the meantime, I can thoroughly recommend this next video. Jeremy headed to Belgium to spend a day in the life of cyclocross legend Sven Nace, who's busy coaching the next generation of cyclocross greats. You can find that down here. I'll see you next week. Bye for now.